So right about now, you're probably thinking, Oh, but Xander, I love to carry a princess on my back. Why are you complaining? Well, my soft-spoken and naive friend, this princess was many things. Annoying, brash, heavier than she looked. But above all, she was demanding. I, I mean, sure, she said thank you for picking her sorry ass up, but boy, was she not shy about pushing me around. We've been walking for a few hours with only a few minutes rest in between treks. We were closing in on our destination, and I feared that I would expire before I got there. What a humiliating way to go. Come on! Pick up your feet! Where did you learn to walk? Do you have any balance at all? Oh, you humans could use a tail. Yeah, well, God said no. Decided we didn't need him after we evolved from monkeys. You call this evolved? <laughs> I'm sure a monkey would complain less. You're just so slow compared to those two. Do you call yourself a knight? No, I don't. And they're not carrying a shockingly heavy dragon on their back. Cut me some slack. I thought you said you were grateful. Uh, I am! You should be too. Look at where your hands are. They are around my thighs. Do you think this is something I would let just anyone with a pair of arms do? I don't know. Maybe you're promiscuous. <laughs> I can still breathe fire, you know. I think your bad breath is far worse than your fire breath. Ever since you ate that cod, if you talk to someone too close, you could kill them. What? How d My breath is fine! Shut your mouth, you foolishly... Foolish fool! Is that any way to speak to your savior? No, oh, that reminds me. Phineas, you said that spell you shot at me was supposed to turn me into a dragon. That was the idea at the time, yes. What if it worked and I just melted your face with my dragon breath? I had already thought of that. Oh yeah? What was the plan? No plan. I just thought of it beforehand. It would have sucked. I've also got a question. Let's say I never showed up when I did, and let the spell hit the fool. You say that it turns dragons into humans, right? Well, he's already a human, so what would it have done to him? Melted him. It would have destroyed his organs. It would have been the most painful death imaginable. Imagine a slow, painful, agonizing death where you feel helpless. Dying with the feeling of your blood boiling and your brain slowly melting. It would have been pure hell. Alexander would have... Well then, I regret my decision less. Only... only a little, though. Finally, we're here. Come on, princess. Ride's over. <sighs> it's about time. I think my horse's leg is broken. Perhaps we should put him out of his misery. Very funny. We reached the village, and it was surprisingly lively. I didn't think a fisherman's village would be so happy and loud, but huh, there we were. People were running around all over the place at the market. And Phineas grabbed my arm and pulled me aside. What is it? If Iron hadn't jumped in front of that spell, it would have done nothing to you. Tickled you at the very worst. In fact, if Iron hadn't done anything, she would be a dragon. You would be unharmed. I very likely would have been terribly confused and shocked to such a degree that you would have been able to surprise me, apprehend me, and bring me in alone, likely becoming a knight in the process. Wow. She literally ruined everything. Well, not for me she didn't. But don't tell her. She'll likely kill us both. I very much doubt her ego could take it. Unless you like your face in liquid form. Yeah, I think I'll pass for now. Then he just walked ahead of me next to Iron and Edith, and I followed. Iron was looking around, very confused. It was definitely a change of scenery from the markets in Vespira. Edith put her hands on her hips, stretching her shoulders back. I believe this is the town of Sandersil. It is. 
Local journeyman's village outside of Vespira. Well, they trade with us, but they've been kind to us overall. Treat them with respect. Very well. How will we get money, though? I don't see any help wanted signs. Maybe not help wanted, but perhaps wanted signs in general. I'm gonna see if there's any bounties up. Hmm, fine idea. We'll try to track down any criminal scum you can find. Bringing them to justice will reward us with money and good karma. That's rich coming from you. Stay out of trouble. But of course, I'm as charming as can be. I'm going to mingle for a bit with the more wealthy folk. Perhaps they have use of magic or a rumor one might hear. Nothing the rich love more than the drama of the poor. That left Iron and I. There was no way I was going to let this girl walk around by herself. I sighed and looked down at her. Couldn't see her face due to the hood, but she was looking straight ahead. Come on, we'll talk to a few merchants and see if they need anything. Iron didn't move. She just stayed facing forward. I bent down to get closer. Her cheeks were red, and her eyes looked toward her feet. Hey, you okay? You scared? Hmm? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. Nothing scares me. I'm just thinking, that's all. Oh, what about? Uh, dragon stuff? Dragon stuff? Stuff that dragons think about. Right. Well, you can think while you walk. Just let me do all the talking. Feel free not to stay close, though, since, you know, you're not scared. <sighs> Shut up. I am not scared. We walked through the long street looking left and right. I felt kind of at home, to be honest. These people were my people, despite me not living here. The impoverished, just trying to get by. I felt their pain. And their joy when they made a few gold from a sale. I looked down at Iron, who, despite her earlier comment, was inching closer and closer to me. I frowned. I could tell that she was trying to stay strong, but large crowds of people obviously made her uncomfortable. Tell you what, I'll go talk to him over there, fruit salesman. I'll see if he has anything to eat. Put a few gold in my pocket. You hungry? A little. Alright, stay here, okay? Alexandra, wait! Relax, I'll be right... I stopped when I felt something cold and slithery wrap itself around my wrist. It was scaly and strong, as if one strong, flexible muscle. I looked down to see a black, scaled coil wrapped around it. It was Iron's tail. She reached out with her hand and laced her fingers through mine, and released my wrist with her tail. I don't want to hold your hand, so don't get the wrong idea. I just... I... <laughs> I don't want to be alone. <laughs> okay. Come on. Let's go together. Ahem. <sighs> Thank you for letting me hold your hand. Acknowledged. The fruit vendor looked lively and friendly, just like most people in the town. He was waving at anyone who passed by. I approached the stall, pointing out different fruits to Iron to see what she wanted. Atta boy. Huh? Uh, pardon? Wait. Aren't you the bartender from Vespira? What? Nah, that's my brother, Frank. Ah, I wish more young men were like you. I tell you, no chivalry these days. What do you mean? Well, I mean, look at you. Picking out some fruit for your cute wife. Oh, bless your heart. What? My... Me? I I'm not... Uh... We slowly turned to each other and saw each other's red cheeks and flustered expression. We immediately turned away at the very sight of one another. Being locked together for eternity? <sighs> Absolutely ridiculous. I'm afraid I must correct you, but... Yes, she's right. She's not my wife. Yet. Precisely. And I would never... I'm sorry, what? I turned to Iron and held both of her hands close to my chest. She blinked and dropped her jaw, her cheeks reddening again. 
Can you feel it, dear? The gentle rumble of my heart? The very thought of us being together forever makes me feel as though I can walk on clouds, as if I could conquer the world! A king amongst men, oh, how my soul breathes for you! In the world are you- And I'd like nothing more than to buy you a sweet fruit to personify how sweet you are in my life. <sighs> so beautiful. We looked over at him, and he was weeping softly, wiping tears from his eyes. Iron blinked, obviously flustered. Here, have an apple on the house. A token of my gratitude for letting me have a taste of youth once again. Bless you two on your journey. Do you hear that, my love? This kind salesperson has bestowed us a gift for simply being in love. Say thank you. Iron turned to me, her expression a mix of anger and embarrassment. She slowly turned back towards the vendor and pulled her hood over her eyes. <laughs> thank you. Aren't you so in love with this young man? Does his very presence warm your heart? Oh man, this was too good. Uh, to be honest, I only started doing this to get under her skin, and let me tell you, it worked. Uh, but this was way better than what I was expecting. Seeing the uptight princess get so red-faced was hilarious. Although, there was something else. Seeing her lips quiver and her eyebrows slant in such a defensive and flustered face was sort of sweet. Even when she was angry, she was kind of cute. Only kind of, though. Don't get the wrong idea. She gripped my hand tight, almost crushing it in a I hate you for making me do this kind of way. Yes. Yes, it does. Ah, oh, bless you both. Many children upon you. I grabbed the apple and presented it in front of Iron. I smiled sweetly at her. Here you go, dear. Without a second thought, she snatched the apple from my hand and walked away, taking a bite. I waved to the vendor, giggling as I walked behind Iron. She continued eating the apple as we approached the tavern. We could probably find something in there. Maybe they would have some work that would suit you. Better that than you conning the vendors of their apples. I agree. I could definitely do some cooking. Roasting some mutton for the local riffraff should be easy. Go ahead and find Edith and Phineas and tell them to meet us inside, okay? Wait a moment. She grabbed my hand before I walked inside. I turned around to face her. Her head was still down. I frowned. Still scared, huh? You know, it's okay. I understand. This is all new to you. It's not that. She gently ran her fingers up my arm and walked close to me. The tingle of her sharp nails gently grazing my skin sent chills through my body. Even in human form, her unmistakable warmth engulfed my skin. I felt this once in the forest when I felt her scales. She looked up at me and into my eyes softly. <laughs> I just... I'll miss you, you know? What? The, th <laughs> the things you said. It makes me wonder if... You and I... <laughs> You, you and I? My neck was warm. This girl was unreal. The way her eyes looked were insanely cute, even, no, especially because they were dragon eyes and my face was nearly blood red. Suddenly, she burst out laughing. I, I, I blinked, confused as hell. She was just looking at me with shy bedroom eyes and now she was laughing? What was I missing? She looked at me with a sly smirk with her brows raised. Not so funny, is it, Romeo? <laughs> God, would you look at your face? I'll miss you, you know. <laughs> As if! Get your head out of your rear and get a job. She turned around, walking away, laughing obnoxiously to herself. I stared at her with murder eyes. Although, let's be honest, I can't say I didn't deserve that. I walked inside and immediately got hit with the aroma of meat and beer. Home sweet home. Now, I just needed to find a way into the kitchen. I'll admit, 
Walking around in a new town was daunting, to be sure, but I was determined. I grew up in a city of dragons, and the last thing I would let myself feel was fear. I took care to keep my head down, knowing that anyone that approached me was a danger to our secrecy. Finding Edith and Phineas was our number one priority. At least, that's what I told myself any time I saw something that caught my eye. Which, admittedly, was often. Listen, I don't know what Alexander has told you about me, but it's not like I was an, ooh, look at the shiny thing, kind of girl. But let me ask you this. If you were in the City of Dragons, and the dragons were selling things, would you not be the least bit curious? That's what I thought. So, you understand my dilemma. Still, I stayed vigilant. A ball fell in front of me, and I stopped in my tracks and looked down. I thought about picking it up, but I remembered that I had razor sharp talons, and I stopped myself. A young boy ran up to me and stopped. He looked at me cautiously as he pointed toward the ball. Play? He was so cute. His eyes were so full of wonder and curiosity that I couldn't help myself. I nudged the ball back to him with my foot. The ball rolled back over to him and he picked it up. He looked at it for a few moments before looking back at me and grinning. He ran up to me and hugged me around the leg. My body felt so warm and toasty, I just beamed at him. I knelt down and patted him on the head softly. Run along, okay? Your parents are probably worried. Wow, your nails, they look like wolves. Are you part wolf? <laughs> Why, yes I am. And I'm looking for my wolf friends. A young woman with short hair and a man with a beard. A lady? No, only lady I see is you. But man with a beard I saw, talking to the mayor's wife. Have you seen them? Oh, is that so? Now which way was that? He pointed behind him. In the distance, I saw Phineas sitting at a table drinking out of a wine glass. I rolled my eyes and looked back at the boy. I motioned for him to run along and he did so with a smile. I walked down the street and kept my eyes on Phineas. As I approached, I noticed that he was laughing. He took a sip out of the wine glass. I couldn't agree more, madam. And might I say, that woman that vexes you? What a wrench. I mean, to wear the same color of garment on the same day as you? I mean, you very clearly called the rights for it. <clears throat> mm hmm. Oh, uh, hello, Iron. Sorry, as I was saying. <clears throat> <laughs> Can I help you with something, or are you just here to cause an unnecessary amount of noise? I'm kind of busy. Oh, yes. Real busy. Gossiping with the locals sure is hard work, wouldn't you agree? He took a sip from his glass and stood up as he motioned for me to follow him. He bowed politely to the woman, and she smiled and waved him off. As we started walking next to each other, he sighed. <sighs> I wasn't just sitting around doing nothing. That woman is the wife of the older man. Getting on her good side would have maybe been able to swing some jobs our way. Politicking has no prejudice towards large cities or small towns. It's always a useful tool. Uh-huh. Praying on the naivete of peasants sounds like it's right up your alley. I assume you found something of note? Actually, no. At least, nothing that would help get us money. But I did hear something interesting. Oh? What's that? We turned around to see Edith standing there, a few papers clutched tightly in her hand. She had a rather triumphant expression on her face. Once again, this particular human had proved herself to be resourceful and useful. I heard there was a murder nearby in some woods. Didn't get a lot of details, but I heard it wasn't pretty. Lots of cuts and slashes. Who knows what that could be? A wild animal, maybe? Knowing our luck? No. We can talk more about this inside the tavern. The useless one went inside to talk about making some money. <laughs> Cut up some slack. He may not be super heroic, but 
I guarantee you this mission wouldn't go near as well without him. If it was just you and I, Edith, we would have finished this within days. No. If it were just you and I, it would starve to death. Listen, I get it. You have some sort of weird feelings against Xander. But he's trying. He's really trying. Play nice. I thought about her words, and in a way, she was right. He was incompetent, annoying, and he thought he was a lot funnier than he was. But I suppose he was trying, however much that was worth. We approached the tavern and began walking inside. You sent him in here, huh? I wonder if he's gotten anything done. Perhaps some information on the murder? Why does that interest you so much? You some kind of detective? Heavens no, I just... It strikes me as odd. People carry swords and axes all the time. Could have been that. Ah, yes. I suppose I should just let it go. Agreed. We have bigger problems after all. Like picking up after whatever mess Alexander has left behind. Order up! We turned toward the kitchen to see Alexander putting a large plate of food on the counter. He was wearing an apron and had a massive grin on his face. I blinked trying to process everything that was happening. It was impossible. He had gotten a job in such a short space of time. He was wearing a uniform, cooking their specials. How did he do that? <laughs> Useless, huh? I scowled at her as she walked toward the table and sat. Phineas followed her, and I did the same. We sat together, and Phineas lowered his hood. I tried to lower mine, but Phineas grabbed it and kept it stationary. Horns. <sighs> God damn it. Excuse me, waitress. A young woman with shortish black hair turned to face us. She was very pretty and had a bright smile. Hello, welcome to Thirsty Lion. My name's Tara. What can I do for you travelers? Let your chef know that his friends are here. We need to have a meeting love. No chef? She put her hand on her chin, thinking. Suddenly, her eyes lit up. Oh, you mean Xander! God, what a stud. Jumping right in the kitchen and taking control. And cute to boot. <laughs> you hear that, are we? I turned away, ignoring what she had just said. I can't explain it, but for some reason, I was irritated. Couldn't imagine I would know why, though. Tara briefly walked away, filled up some mugs with water, and put them in front of us. I'll tell him right away. Be right back. She pranced energetically to the kitchen. Edith and Phineas had a brief conversation about potential jobs as they went over the papers that she'd brought with her. I, on the other hand, watched Tara and Alexander twitter about in the kitchen. She flashed him a sort of smile that I hadn't seen before, and it obviously made him nervous. He grinned sheepishly and waved her away. Iron, cool it. Are you okay? What? What do you mean? Your nails. You're carving up the table. I looked down to see my nails nearly impaled into the table. I slowly pulled them away and blinked. I hadn't even noticed I was doing that. I stared at my nails for a few moments, wondering just what was happening to me. I wasn't used to all of these emotions. But for some reason that I couldn't explain, I was irritated. And the only thing worse than being irritated was being irritated for not knowing why you're irritated. I was missing my throne more and more by the second. Fortunately for Iron, who was dirt poor, by the way, she didn't have to pay for the table that she ruined. When I asked her about it, she snapped at me and told me to shut up. Who knows what that crazy woman was thinking? The conversation in the tavern was short and not worth talking about. We just discussed other ways to get money and how long we'd been staying in town. Turns out, a lot longer than we expected. We'd been holed up in the inn for two weeks. Iron and Edith shared a room, and I was bunking with Phineas. After the conversation, Phineas told me to meet him by the river near the town. He told me to bring my swords. If you don't come at me with the intent to kill, you won't win. 
Believe me. You are trying my patience enough, that is. Do not remind me that killing you is a possibility. It's that kind of talk that's preventing you from learning anything. One more time. I gripped my swords and flipped them in my hands. They were shoddy, rusty things, and I was able to steal them from the barracks before we left Vespira. No one would miss it. My swords that I used two weeks prior in the fight against the golems were at the bottom of a pond, and I did not see me getting those back. I rushed at Phineas and he cast his hand at me. Suddenly a patch of earth erupted from the ground under me into a pillar. I dodged left and kept my pursuit. Phineas let fly a barrage of stones from behind him, and I was able to dodge most of them and deflect the view. One hit me in the shoulder and I stumbled. Phineas noticed. He beckoned his hand from the ground quickly, and a pillar of earth shot up and hit me in the chest. It knocked me back and I dropped my swords. I tumbled on the ground backwards. I was face down in the dirt. Uh, again, up. This is hardly fair. Ugh. You're using magic. And? So will some of your opponents. You need to be ready for that. If I was fighting you without my golem back then, you'd be dead. And I noticed some things. You're running with your swords behind you. What is that? Your chest is wide open. You're relying on your speed and agility far too much. You need to have your swords at least at your sides or in front of you so you can block the next hit. Your stance is too narrow when you're idle. And you're not idle enough. The art of movement isn't just staying moving. It's knowing when to start and stop. How do you know all this? You're a mage. I wasn't always. I used to be a swordsman before I took up a more effective means of defending myself. In fact, I was an assistant instructor. Forgive me if I'm not in awe. Sarcasm is unbecoming of you. I don't need to widen my legs or whatever. I'm a great sword fighter. Once I understand your patterns, I'll be able to take you on no problem. Not if you're dead before you figure it out. <sighs> you just don't understand how blessed you are. What do you mean? What I mean is that you're talentless. The, <laughs> the hell did you just say? You heard me. Talentless. Oh, stop looking at me with that snarl. It's true. And it's not an insult. You just said I'm not good at this. Why would I not be offended? Phineas began approaching me and pulled something from his satchel. It was a black cloth, long and thin. <sighs> My final class I ever taught had 42 students. 38 of them were talented. Two of them were prodigal. One of them was otherworldly and had instincts beyond any swordsman I've seen. And the last one was completely and utterly talentless. No instincts, no natural abilities. What was he doing in your class then? She and her brother was in the military and died. She felt that she had to leave her life behind and become what her brother was. She was a painter, soft and sweet. She was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. And one day, she became my wife. You're married? I was. Oh. What, what happened? She's gone. Oh. Phineas, I, I'm so sorry. I, you know, my, my dad told me about my mom dying a few times. And I can understand it's it's extremely heart wrenching. Hmm. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no. No. Oh. Oh. No. No. Uh, she left me. Anyway. You are literally the worst. As I was saying, she was talentless, no natural ability whatsoever. Whenever we did exercises, she was the last to finish. Whenever we dueled. She'd be the only one without a win. Whenever we tested for the next rank, she'd be left behind. One day the master asked me who I thought out of all 42 students I believed we should teach privately and capitalize on their abilities. Do you know who I chose? Your wife? What? <laughs> no. 
The one with all the talent, of course. However, you are smarter than I was 15 years ago, because I should have picked her. My master disagreed with my assessment, and he chose my wife as his star pupil. Do you know why? She was hot? Not everyone is as hormonal as you are, Xander. Because she was talentless. When you are talentless at a certain activity, you have no preferences or pre-written tendencies. A talentless swordsman doesn't favor offense or defense inherently, and can balance those things equally. They do not have the confidence and ego of being good at something. They are a blank slate. Tell me, if you were an artist, and you wanted to paint your masterpiece, what are you going to pick? A canvas that already has half the surface painted, or a completely blank canvas to idolize your vision on? So, what, uh, I, I'm, I'm some sort of blank canvas? Yes. You have a blessing. Because you say you're a great sword fighter, but you don't believe that. Do you even know how you were able to beat the golems? Uh, instinct? You don't have any. What do you remember feeling? During the battle, I mean. I... I, I don't really know. I, I don't really remember thinking about it. I just remember acting, jumping in and attacking. I not really thinking about what I was doing. Saw the rune on the first one and pounced. The second one, I just... New gravity was going to win that fight. Rest calm. What? You activated your rest calm. Or at least a primitive and basic version of it. Something only talentless individuals can do. I can't activate it. Never could. It's the ability to deactivate your emotions and doubts. To only think about your opponent and victory. It's the ability to search for definitive and swift means to eviscerating your foe, decisively and undisputedly. It's a dangerous thing to fight against. However, you seem to only activate it under the threat of death. Is that why you're trying to kill me? Precisely. Phineas handed me the cloth. It was a blindfold. He motioned me to put it on, and without thinking, I did. I heard him walk away from me and eventually stop. I'm going to craft a sword made of earth, and we're going to duel now. Again, intent to kill, or you won't win. But I can't see. So? Well, just in case you forgot, seeing is kind of what makes sword fighting possible in the first place. How the hell am I supposed to beat you if I don't even know where you're at? You don't need to. Believe in yourself, Sander. You're talentless, not hopeless. What does that even mean? The air around you will give me away. The sound of the swings, the vibrations of my footwork on the ground. Your soul will speak to you when it's ready. Believe that the spirit inside will be your eyes. But I can't see you. <sighs> you don't need to, Xander. Seeing is what makes you blind. You will come across an opponent that uses illusions and tricks of the eye to better you. And when that day comes, you will have to ignore all feelings of doubt and second-guessing what your eyes present you. You must trust in your heart that you will win, even without your eyes. Only by removing your sight can you truly see. Let's begin. Over the next hour, I deflected exactly one of Phineas's sword attacks, Thank God he saw that coming and made his earth sword dull as a stick. Otherwise, someone else would be telling you this story. The one deflection was pretty cool, though. It was near the end. But of course, right after the deflection and I briefly celebrated, Phineas smacked me in the side of the neck with the sword and I fell over. A few more tries later, and we decided to call a day and head back. You think you remember that healing spell you used on the iron? I could use some of that. Bruises and scars are what remind warriors not to get hit again. I'll dull the pain for now, but I won't remove the marks. But you were a complete idiot when we met. Apparently you're wiser than you seem. 
Well, of course. That's why they call me Phineas the Wise. Who's they? And I thought they called you Phineas the Evil! <laughs> and where's the Orkin? Because you don't have the voice for it. Observe. <clears throat> Phineas the Evil! <laughs> How the hell are you doing that? What? You know what? And if you're so wise, why did you steal from the library? I told you, it's the only reason I joined. I wanted to see if I could control dragons. How was you even done with that knowledge? Hmm. I don't know, really. Have you ever just done something to see if you could? Simply to test the limits of what you can make possible. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I think that's a universal thing. Once I climbed the tallest tree in the forest near my house just to see if I could. Limitations are evidence of our humanity. Only by surpassing them can we truly break that label. Wise words. <laughs> you know, maybe I... What is it? I smell blood. Human blood. Hmm. You don't think there's someone in trouble, do you? I don't know, but the scent is close. It's this way. <sighs> is this really our concern? So what if some hunter got a cut on his knee? How's that our problem? Have some compassion. If someone's hurt, we might be able to help. You can use that healing spell I've been wondering about. Benice and I walked carefully in the direction of ascent. We were careful not to make too much sound in case there were wild animals near the spot of the blood. If I could smell it, so could they. We approached a dislodged branch and inspected it. It was cut clean through, far too clean for any weapon, as if the very reality around it just split. There was no way an animal could have done this. Phineas, look at this. No, Xander. Look at this. I looked over at him. He was knelt down, looking at the body of a man. The body was mangled and cut viciously. There were clean, straight slices all over his body. He was dead. My gaze hardened. We're going to need to tell someone. Phineas turned to me and nodded. I left him with the body and made my way back to Sanderstill. I immediately found the local authorities and told them what I found. As I did so, Iron and Edith overheard me and asked me where the body was. I told all of them and they followed me. As I arrived, Phineas was still there, keeping watch. The authorities began asking questions. Phineas and I told them what we knew, and they said that they were going to send for someone. After about an hour, a portly man came in in a semi-formal doublet. He was short and had a bushy black mustache and piercing blue eyes. I'm Detective Ashley. I you the two men who found this part of that? Yeah, we just got back from training and found him like this. He from Vespera? Yes, I'm a private in the Vesperan army. I'd like to speak to your supervisor about your doings here. Look no further. Youth Tombs. First sergeant in the Vesperan army. We're on a private mission. Edith Tomes. I've heard about you. Heard you're quite the investigator as well. Then you wouldn't mind if I take up this investigation? This is out of Vespera's jurisdiction. Incorrect. Sander still is seven and a half miles from Vespera, and this spot is halfway between the northeastern river and Sander still. The distance between town and river is less than a half a mile. Vespera's jurisdiction is a ten mile radius outside the city's gates in all directions, including this direction. <laughs> You've done your homework. Fine. I could use you to help. And we could use the money. I'm going to inspect the body. Be my guest. I'm going to ask around town to see if um, anyone has an idea on this coy. Hershey walked away towards the town, and Edith bent down, gently moving the man's limbs and head or checking for wounds. Immediately, the left arm fell off. Edith reared back and groaned. It was as if the arm was detached from the beginning and the body happened to fall perfectly into place. That, or the murderer placed it there. Can you tell what happened to him, Edith? I can't say for sure. Straight and clean lacerations all over the torso and a few on the legs. As if someone cut into him with a wire. 
Can't say for sure what happened to the arm. The only way you can get a laceration this clean is if the person is completely still for the cut. Or if the cut is too fast to move during. Look, there's blood on his fingernails. Do you think that belongs to someone else? Very likely. Perhaps defensive wounds. Or maybe this is the result of defense. Our victim here could have attacked the murderer, causing them to act in self-defense. We can't say for sure unless we had a statement from the witness. But we don't seem to be that lucky. What's more concerning to me is how these cuts happened. It's human instinct to move and wince when in pain. So when someone gets cut, they're likely going to move during the cut, causing it to stray from its path, even slightly. Then what cut him? I don't see any weapons around here. That's what's troubling me. Look at these wounds. Even the entry is clean. There's no jaggedness to them. It's as if the area around him cut. There's no sign of metal around his wounds. No evidence of residue of weapons. No tool did this. How can you be sure? My eyes are far sharper than that of a human's. Look at this. What is it? I saw this earlier, but it vexes me. This branch was completely sliced through. Way too clean to be an axe. Not even splinters or shavings of wood hanging off. Hmm. Wait a minute. Edith turned her head and walked around him. She looked in the direction of the village, then back to the body. He faced this way. His back was to that tree with the missing branch. Then, if he was facing this way, his arm and the branch were cut in the same motion. But how is that possible? They're several yards apart from one another. Must have been a long blade. Or perhaps not a blade at all. Phineas knelt down and examined the wounds. He took his fingers and opened one of the lacerations. A very, very faint air pocket left the wound. Hmm. It's just as I feared. What? This man was killed by wind magic. We all hardened our gaze at the man. It made sense. There was no man-made weapon that could have cut this clean through two surfaces in one swing. Edith crossed her arms. Well then, mystery solved. I knew you'd slip up eventually, criminal. But this? I didn't expect you to stoop this low. Don't be ridiculous. I couldn't have done this. And why is that? evil wizard two reasons firstly i have an alibi how long would you say he's been dead approximately 13 hours i was in the in room with xander from the time we finished our meeting yesterday to when we awoke this morning can you confirm that xander i can i was with him the whole time he snored a lot I'm going to ignore that the other reason is quite simple i can't use wind magic Mages can only use one element, and in rare cases, two. I am attuned to earth magic primarily, if you couldn't tell. I've dabbled a very tiny bit in water magic, hence the healing, but that's it. I have literally no knowledge on how to use wind magic. If you didn't do it, then who? D don't look at me, I can only use fire magic. Besides, why would I want some measly human dead? I walked over to where the body was facing and knelt down. I noticed a few tracks and broken twigs. I touched them lightly, hoping to get an indent. Found footprints. Two pairs. The victims and a smaller pairs. Two footprints heading this way and one going back. Can you tell if it's a man or a woman? No. Either a man with small feet or a woman with large ones, but that's not the scary part. I pointed to the direction we came. The other footprints head back to Sander still. So, the Wind Mage is in town. This is dangerous. We're going to have to ask around. I'll begin with the Alderman's wife. She still owes me some information. We can't spend too much time on this. Remember, our primary mission is turning Iron back. As if I'd forgotten. I just want to see justice be served. Be careful. This mage is dangerous and obviously willing to kill. Sleep with one eye open. We share a town with a murderer. <laughs>